Hey Crossings, thanks for joining us uh, today on this video. Today's going to look a little bit different. Um, today we're going to be talking about what church and being in community with one another looks like in this next season that we're about to enter into. And there's a song that we sing that clearly lays out kind of a goal or a telos um, for what it is uh, the church should be and what we feel as crossings, um, this community in Knoxville that we are called to be too. Um, and this song is called, We Will Feast in the House of Zion. And throughout scripture, we kind of see this image of the house of Zion, uh, but it's, it's very rarely that we talk about what this means. Um, the house of Zion uh, throughout scripture represents this new creation that God is going to bring, this new shalom that God is going to bring, where he will make whole and restore uh, and reconcile all things through Jesus Christ. So today, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to start by singing that song, because uh, we believe as a staff and as leaders that today is the first step uh, for the next season um, and what it means in being for being in community with one another and what it means to be the church in our neighborhoods and in our city and in our state and in the world. So if you all would, um, pray with me. God, we're so grateful uh, this day to be uh, in virtual community with one another. We ask that uh, though there are boundaries of time and space that you would unify us by your Holy Spirit, that you would bind us together, that you would give us a common vision and common dream and common good uh, for your world. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Hey, Crossings. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's uh, good to be together in this way. We're grateful again, as always, every week that you take the time uh, to be in community with us. So it was about 14 years ago this month that a few of us um, wrestled through what we felt God was calling us to as a community. A community at that time that didn't even have a name. We didn't even know what we were going to call it. And so what we had to consider was here at the beginning of this faith community, what, what did we believe? Like foundational beliefs to, to build this community upon. What we thought about Jesus and scripture, things like that. What we valued, um, that turned into story and wholeness and uh, restoration and authenticity and creativity. And then also about what we were dreaming about becoming. What did we think God wanted to birth in our community? And in case you need a refresher, here are those 10 dreams. We dream of a community where we listen to and are obedient to God and where the biblical story of God is taught and lived out. We dream of a community where people celebrate the mystery of God together every week, not to consume, but to be consumed. And where faith is seen as a journey Change is assumed, innovation is expected, and rebirth is welcomed. We dream of a community where everyone is encouraged to wrestle with and through the questions of life and God, and where beauty, art, and creativity are valued, used, and understood as coming from the Creator. We dream of a community where every person immerses themselves in their neighborhoods and communities, and where each person understands how God has created them, and they use those gifts as a rhythmic community. We dream of a community where people feel free to dream big dreams about how they might participate in putting the world back together, and where all people everywhere are made whole in Jesus. And so here we are, 14 years later, 13 and a half years since we launched as a faith community. And I can say uh, with great satisfaction that these BVDs, that's what we call our beliefs, values, and dreams, are still very much a part and at the center of who we are as a community that is always attempting to help people find their way back to God. Even in the midst of, of a pandemic, as we all sort through and deal with all kinds of different brokenness in both big and small ways. We have tried to maintain those beliefs and values and pursue those dreams. Even as we've not been able to gather for what, I think we're going on 24 weeks now, that we haven't been able to gather face to face publicly, we've been gathering in all sorts of different ways, including this way, in order to live out those beliefs, values, and dreams. And as we all try to endure this time of brokenness and crisis in our world, we have consistently asked the question and tried to evaluate, is there a way for us to come back together and meet face to face and gather publicly together? Not so that we can reopen. We never closed as a faith community. Hopefully you understand that. And as we've wrestled with that question, our constant conclusion, both uh, leaders and staff and many of those that we've talked to, you all that we've talked to in our community, um, both Chris and Barry, elementary school where we meet, and the square room where we meet, have simply been unsafe for us to gather in. We just have very little control over what goes on in those places. And so we have not been able to, to meet with what we felt were meeting the minimum requirements for us gathering back together. And so we haven't wanted to run the risk of doing something harmful to our community, and honestly, doing something harmful to the story of the church and Jesus followers in the city because whatever we do and however we react, we're telling a story by how we react and people are watching and people are listening and we haven't wanted to do any harm to any of that. And here's the thing. We are here on August 23rd, uh, some six months later or so, and we feel the same way we felt in March. Now, now let me be clear as I possibly can for the reasons that we feel this way. It just doesn't make any sense for us to put our community in harm's way. <laughs> here's, here's how we look at it. We have been given the responsibility of stewardship of a community. 
Uh, we have been given care of a community, of, of each other. And so the leaders and the staff have to make the decision of how to be as responsible as we possibly can with what we've been given to care for. And taking the medical risk to meet publicly and to do so with about maybe 20% of our community who would feel comfortable doing so, and in a way that would be that in a way that would be completely awkward and not in a way that we'd normally gather, that has not seemed to be the best way to lead and steward this community well. And in addition, just so you understand, I think we always have to ask the question of why would we meet when the risk is as it is? I've asked that question of a lot of different people. We've asked it over and over of ourselves. And let me answer that with something you have heard me say before. Our goal is not to get as many people as possible in a room, get you to give as much money as you can, and simply be a place that serves uh, and caters to the needs of those who are on the inside. That's never been our goal. That's never why we've met as a church. That's never been what we've been about. Our goal is to be a community of people who give a vision, a picture of what it means to love Jesus and to center our lives on him and to live as people sent by the same Jesus. That's our goal, to give that image, to give that picture, and then to go out and live that. And logically, it makes no sense to focus our energies and resources on creating then a potentially unsafe, restricted environment on Sundays in two different buildings, two different places, for gatherings that very few of us feel safe to attend. That's not good stewardship. That's not caring well for what God has given us. So as we continue to try and be the community God has called us to be, we are asking, so what do we do now? August 23rd, 2020, where we are right now, what is it we do? What now? So here it is. The decision of the leaders and unanimously, by the way, is this, that we're going to wait until at least 2021 before we attempt any large public gathering. And you need to know this is really completely a mission and vision decision based upon all those things I just shared with you. It's not based upon any what it's not based upon what anyone else is doing. It's not based upon emotion. It's not based upon politics or how we feel about any mandate given from any side. That's never been who we are, and it's not going to be who we are. It's based upon helping people find their way back to God. What's the best way to do that? What's the best way to live on mission for Jesus? What's the best way to represent Jesus in the city? That will always drive us, always motivate us. Helping people find their way back to God will always be our why. Now let me state what I think and I hope is obvious. Crossings as a community is not closed. <laughs> if the church is just the church when you have a Sunday gathering, I'm not even sure you can call that being the church. We all know there's so much more to it. And as hard as it's been, we've been given an opportunity to see how well we can be the people of God in this time. The church should be seen as, as helping the brokenness of the world, helping to put the world back together, and not contributing to the brokenness of it. So you might ask, what happens if things are not better in January in 2021? We don't know. But you have our word, we'll make every decision that we make based upon those same factors, driven by the same mission, driven by the same beliefs and the values and the dreams. So then the question practically is, how do we, how do we move forward now? Well, we think we're gonna need uh, to learn to ask different questions, which is very much a part of our DNA. It's very much who we are. To think about it from a different angle. My daughter, Megan, uh, who lives in New York City, uh, is teaching chess. And she teaches it online. She's taught it online even before the pandemic. And she teaches it like to three and four and five year olds. And what she does when she teaches chess, she, she teaches it as a story, as, as theater, where you have the queen and you have the king and you have the bishop. And, and she teaches them as characters who have certain roles that can do certain things that have certain powers. And she teaches kids the basics of, of chess. Back in March, uh, we talked about how this game of chess plays itself out for us. Um, basically, Sunday gatherings are the queen in this game of chess, and the queen has been removed from the board. <laughs> we can still play. The game of chess still goes on, but we have to learn to play without the queen on the board. 
we, we, we need to learn a different strategy. And I think the church as a whole hasn't necessarily understood this. I think the church as a whole has been asking checker questions while pretending to play chess. The questions are not, how do we get back to normal? But how do we learn to live into this new reality? Not how quickly can we get back in a building, how quickly can we do what we've always done, but how can we learn to live into this new reality? Annie Stanley, who's a pastor down in Atlanta, big mega church there, he said this recently, I read. He said, one of the things I've told our church from the very beginning is we are going to be better for this. There are things that we're going to learn that we're going to take forward. But the only way to be better for this is to embrace this as the new normal, he says. Otherwise, we're just going to sit on our hands and wait for things to get back to normal. A pandemic is a terrible thing to waste. All tragedy is a terrible thing to waste, he says. So we want to be better for it. And I think a lot of churches are going to be better for it because we're forced to try to innovate things. As I've said since week one of all this, we were crossings, our community, you and I, how we have been founded, how we have grown, how we've evolved, we were in many ways made for this time. What we are doing, being the church in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in small gatherings here and there, wherever we're comfortable, crossings has always tried to be about this. We, we were made for this in a way. So then how do we move forward into this new reality as a faith community? Well, that's, that's what we wanna spend time talking about today. Um, We've studied the book of Acts um, since April, I think it's been, and that study has prepared us well. Um, the, the quick review of the book of Acts is that the big idea of it was this idea of break shot, and here's an image with it on it. But this whole idea that in pool, when you hit the cue ball and you break the balls that have been racked up, they scatter everywhere. That's what was happening to these first followers of Jesus post-resurrection. They were all over. And when we entered into the story of Acts, I think we found our own story there. We, we found our story because we are, I believe completely, we are in another break shot moment in our world. And we believe our dreams, which we read earlier, have prepared us well. We believe dreaming for these things and valuing these things and believing these things has prepared us well. But there's especially one dream that I want to focus on. And here it is on the screen. We dream of a community where faith is seen as a journey, change is assumed, assumed, innovation is expected, and rebirth is welcome. So here then, where we find ourselves as a faith community is one piece of the change and innovation that we hope results in rebirth for us all. We hope that's what happens. And so to better position ourselves, staffs, staff and leaders to care and mobilize the people of the Crossings community, what we have done is come up with this plan that has divided the entire faith community of Crossings all across the area that we all come from into three geographical groupings. And we're using the word parish to describe this. Now, I'm not sure what the word parish means to you. I don't know if you've ever used it. I don't know if it has baggage. Try to let all that go. For us, the word parish means that we're going to take a community that is somewhat large. Uh, we have about 400 to 50, uh, 450 to 500 regulars. We're gonna take that community and we're gonna find a way in this break shop moment to care for each other and our neighbors in hopefully a better way than we could have uh, struggling through to playing checkers when we should be playing chess. So this, this phrase, perish, um, it's described really well in this book called The New Parish by Dwight Friesen, Paul Sparks, and Tim Sorens. And here's the quote I want to show you. I'll put it on the screen. The word parish refers to all the relationships, including the land, where the local church lives out its faith together. It is a unique word that recalls a geography large enough to live life together, live, work, play, etc., and small enough to be known as a character within it. Parish is also unique because it is a noun that holds within it a verb. It is a noun in the sense that it represents the church's everyday life 
and relationships within a particular place. But it also functions as, a, as an action word because it calls us to the purpose of the church, living out God's dream and caring for the place we are called. Proximity in the parish allows you to participate in God's reconciling and renewing vision in ways you really can't do as an individual. They say, we are convinced that what may seem at first like a subtle shift actually has the capacity to transform your entire experience of what it means to be the church. Now, I need you to be careful. <laughs> I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. This, this shift, and I think it's a paradigm shift for us as a faith community, this is not us separating ourselves into three different churches. That's not what's going on. This is us finding a way to care for each other better, to take care of each other, to be there in a, in a way that, since we're scattered in this break shop moment, that has been very, very hard to do. We want to find a way to more effectively pay attention to the people and the needs of our community. And also, we, we believe it sets us up to be more of a movement in the city. And honestly, it feels like a very natural step. I, regardless of the pandemic, we would have gotten to this point, I think, eventually. Also, so, so don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. Also, do not hear that any of this, any of this parish talk, is in any way, shape, or form in place of us gathering via YouTube or on Zoom or when the day comes when we can come back face to face. No, those are all still and will still remain in place. We believe the fourfold rhythm of worship each week, even from a distance, even virtually like this, is essential for us as a community. So don't hear that. <laughs> That's not what we're saying. Home groups, session groups, bells groups, they're not going to disappear. Some may evolve into something more, and some will remain the same. We'll, we'll work all that out as we go. We're learning as we go. Again, don't hear what we're not saying. Stucco, Kid City, in some form or another, they may have different angles. They're still very much a part of who we are. But they will evolve. They will look different in a parish model of church, which, which, which we think is a good shift for us. Again, this is about us learning to care for each other and our neighbors in a better way in this time of crisis. We were made for this. We want to take the next few minutes. Um, actually, we're going to take a lot of time over the next three weeks. But today, just take a few more minutes to describe just kind of at a 30,000 foot view what we think this uh, shift means for us and what it may look like. And again, over the next three weeks, we'll unpack it in even more detail. All right, so when we look at a parish, we really said a parish does three things. We're calling it the DNA of our parishes. And so three things they're going to do. The first one is community. Now, community is always that nebulous term. Like nobody knows exactly what community means. So we're going to define community this way. We're going to say community is a body of persons of common interests scattered throughout a larger society. So our crossings community is just that. We're a group of people scattered around this area with a common interest. And that common interest is the mission to help people find their way back to God. And to help make that vision a reality, we come alongside one another to help support and encourage one another. So as a parish, we are going to create avenues, we're going to create pathways to, to pray for one another, to care for one another, to communicate with each other, uh, to come alongside each other as we're all seeking to help people find their way back to God. So that's the first aspect of the DNA of a parish, a community. The second one is formation. So the mission of helping people find their way back to God will only happen in and through Christ. It's just the way it is. It's not going to be our own initiative, our own design. We're going to follow after Jesus and see where Jesus is working. So as we continue to navigate life as followers of Jesus, we want to be shaped more and more like him. And so each parish will join and complement the vision of crossings as we seek to be formed more like Jesus as a community. What's that going to look like? It's going to look like all kinds of different things. It's going to look like maybe uh, home groups that are designed in parish or maybe bells groups per parish. Um, it's going to look like things that we've not even thought up of yet. It's going to be all kinds of ways where we're going to spur one another on to encourage one another another to be formed more like Jesus. So community, formation, and then the third one is mission. 
So each parish is going to be organized around what we call the Missio Dei. It's a Latin term meaning the mission of God. And God's mission is to restore and heal all of creation and to call all people into a reconciled relationship with himself. So as we help people find their way back to God, we are participating in God's agenda for the world. And this mission must form and inform everything we do as a parish. Um, One author, Christopher Wright, he said it this way, It's not so much that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world, which is a whole different way to think about it. It's not our mission. It's God's mission. And as a church in a certain area, we're going to be about it. What does that look like? And so we're going to come alongside each other and we're going to say, what does it look like to be on mission where you, where you live, where you work, where you play? Uh, especially during this time in this pandemic, it's kind of hard. It's like, hey, well, what does this look like? Well, we're going to navigate that together as a parish. So again, the DNA of our parish, community, formation, and mission. So you may be asking how we will be intentional about the elements of community and formation and mission within our parishes. How will we work together to accomplish our dreams for those areas? Well, those are a lot of the conversations that we are having as a staff and that we will continue to have as a community. We will have to incorporate a lot of grace for one another as we navigate this new frontier together. For the community and mission, we hope to keep casting vision around monthly virtual greenhouses. This will be a time for us to gather as a community that is journeying together as we all find our way back to God. And then we will split off into geographical parishes to focus on how that mission plays out within our context. Our dream for our parishes is that we will become so well connected within our parishes that an organic movement of care develops. We hope that we have a community where we start to naturally become aware of one another's needs and our assets and that we start to connect the two. The big question that I've been wrestling with lately is how do we care for our children and our families? And I want to reassure you that they have not been forgotten. Trust me, I think about it constantly. And in a time where school is moving virtually and parents and guardians have lost their structure and routine, I don't think that striving to meet virtually is what we desire, nor is it what our kids need or how they learn. Our kids need true connection. They too are experiencing this full spectrum of emotions during this time. And I realize that my role has now shifted and evolved in addition to this need for emotional and spiritual support for our children deepening. I am now shifting to more of a family pastor. I'm here to come alongside parents and guardians as they are the ones connecting and doing life with their kids every day. The pastors of each parish are also also there to come alongside and equip and empower parents and guardians as they teach and guide their children. How will this look exactly? I'm not sure, but I do know it's important. Actually, I think it is vital to our growth as a faith community and to our children's growth. And as I've been thinking about how we need to come alongside our children, I think that we need to consider how we can help them navigate the unknown and the fears that accompany that. I've always been fascinated by the story of Ruby Bridges. If you're not familiar with her, she was a six-year-old girl who was the first African-American girl um, child to desegregate the all-white William France Elementary School in Louisiana in 1960. And she entered into school every day with federal officers surrounding her to protect her and people hurling insults at her. And a psychiatrist named Robert Coles volunteered to support and counsel Ruby's family during that period of time. And in a Disney movie that was made about her, Robert Coles was reflecting upon his observations of Ruby. And this is what he said. I learned that a family and a child under great stress and fear 
could show exquisite dignity and courage because of their moral and religious values and because they had definite purpose in what they were trying to accomplish. This purpose made them resilient. I couldn't figure out the source of this resilience. I had only ever worked with well-to-do children who really had nothing to work hard for, no reason driving them to accomplish anything. Now I realize that the issue is not stress, but stress for what purpose? Having something to believe in protected Ruby from psychiatric symptoms and gave her a dignity and strength that is utterly remarkable. Friends, our mission is not changing. Our belonging is still found in love. Our identity is still found in grace. And our mission is still to serve the world and to help people find their way back to God. This unwavering source of identity, belonging, and mission stabilizes us, and it provides access to a source of strength to equip us. It should be a great comfort to us all that we have a community and a network of support, not only for us, but for our children. And I think we all desire that, but it will definitely take some intentionality to get there. Our dream is that by focusing on proximity to one another, we can start to establish a deeper community for each of us and for our children. One thing that we will do to be intentional about this is that each parish will set up communication where we will share needs, celebrations, and prayer requests from within our parish. I think this is an invitation to a deeper and richer life. Does that come with growing pains and discomfort? Yes. <laughs> Does that expect some level of vulnerability and messiness? Yes. But does that mean we could experience authentic connection and community? I think that's our hope and our prayer. So we want to give you a picture and a timeline of what the next few weeks are going to look like for our community, for Crossings. As leaders and as staff, uh, we've met together and we've tried to make things as straightforward as possible for you all. So what I'm about to communicate with you is one date and three things that you need to know about the next month. So let's start with the date. On September 12th, that's a Saturday at 9 a.m., we're going to have a greenhouse event. And in the past, greenhouse, this time for us to gather as leaders uh, and as a community has been an opportunity for us to get together to cast vision, to give updates on our community, and to dream together. Greenhouse will continue to be all of those things for us, but it will look just a little different. Each greenhouse is going to last uh, an hour during this season. The first 10 minutes will be for vision casting. It's going to come from the center, most likely mark or someone in leadership um, and the remaining 50 minutes are going to be a time for us to divide into these parishes to have uh, to figure out what it means to be in community with one another and i imagine that this time in the parishes is going to look like expressing needs uh, offering up prayer for one another dreaming together uh, letting one another know our desires for our community and uh, hashing out next steps for how we can be more intentional about the DNA of these parishes, the community, the formation, and the missional engagements for each of us. And one more thing to note about Greenhouse, this is going to be something you'll probably want to mark your calendars for because every second Saturday of each month, um, we are going to gather and do this together. So mark your calendars. And now the three things. First, in the next two weeks, we as staff are going to make touches with everyone. We're going to either call or email or try to contact each of you in some way. We would love for this um, kind of conversational time to offer space for questions and to have conversations about dreaming with each of you uh, in our community. And the second and third things go together. 
The second is that our website currently is undergoing uh, the finishing touches of a revamp. What this means is that the website will be much more accessible for you all, um, and it will help us as a community to understand and to communicate some of the information that you need to know, such as how to join small groups, reading stories of our people who are practicing the resurrection, uh, any contact info that you would need to get plugged in to our community in a variety of ways. And the third thing is that we're currently in the process of adopting some kind of um, church database platform. Um, the, these conversations are happening as we speak, um, and this will look uh, like replacing and centralizing all of the communication for crossings. The MailChimp uh, for this season has been great for some time, but we're looking for some kind of platform um, that allows us to centralize our communication to small groups, to parishes, to session groups, to bells groups, to leaders, stuco, any group that would be affiliated or under the umbrella of crossings. We're looking for a database to cover. And we also want something, this is the biggest desire of having a database for us or this kind of centralization hub. Um, we just want to organize our ministry and we want to empower you, empower our people. So this will be much more productive than Facebook for us uh, and could potentially be the next step in our asset-based community development conversation. So we will communicate those details to you as they come. Uh, but as for now, you don't need to know anything else but what I just communicated to you about that database. We will uh, make the startup process of you getting involved with that as easy as possible um, in the coming weeks. So then in a very practical way, how are we going to form or shape these parishes? Well, let us show you what, what we've tried to do. Here is a map of our basic area. And if you'll notice, there are three areas there. There's the K, N, and X. And so the boundaries of these areas, again, these are three separate areas. And so if you are in K, which is kind of the west part, uh, west and some of kind of southwest of, of the Knoxville area, the boundaries are on the North Clinton Highway, uh, 640 and Alcoa Highway. Uh, if you are in the south, more southeast and in the east, uh, the boundaries are Alcoa Highway on the west side. Um, Tennessee River is there. It'll go up to Cecil Avenue and then up to Washington Pike. And some of you may have no idea where some of these things are. That's okay. I think you can get the general idea of what we're trying to, to lay out there. So that's X. And then N, which is downtown and north together, that is the center part of there. So north of the river, inside of 640, on the east side of, of Clinton Highway, um, this side of Washington Pike, again, you can see that on the map. So that's how we've decided geographically to divide these parishes. And uh, what we've done then, and we can show the next slide, here are, how, here are the numbers and how it breaks down for our community. So in the, in the K parish, you have 94 adults and 55 kids about 149, and that number changes all the time because we think of someone else or we have to take somebody else off or something like that. So currently, as of today, it's 94 adults, 55 children, and then that's 149 total. And Alan and Brad, Alan Bradford and Brad Campbell will work with that parish. The N parish, uh, Rachel Hudson and myself will work with that, and there's 122 adults, 56 children, 178 total. And then X, which is uh, the east and south, Molly Conaway, and then Will Beam, who is our intern, will be working with the, that X parish. And that's 86 adults, uh, 47 kids, 133 total. So you see how many freaking kids we have. We have a ton of children. And that, that I think is, I don't, 
I don't know if that's middle school and high school down or fifth grade down, but uh, regardless, it's a lot of kids. One thing that worked out nicely is it, the numbers are decently spread across these three regions. Uh, also, uh, our lead team and our ops, our two uh, formal formalized leadership groups, they're pretty evenly spread over these parishes too because lead team and ops are going to have different roles and kind of come along beside us all in different ways in this parish model. If you add up those three numbers, it's about 460, I think, uh, that we are accounting for in these three parishes. Now, that 460 does not include our homeless community, which we value very much. It doesn't include our university students from UT, Johnson, all the different universities in the area, uh, who we also value. But we also don't know how to incorporate those into the parish at, at this point. So, so it's a lot of people. And it doesn't. In, it also obviously doesn't include the 15 to 20 people who come to crossings every Sunday for the first time. It's crazy how many people we have in wonder uh, off the streets or off the square or have heard about us and want to give it a shot. So these are the 460 or so people that are pretty tied into us. So this is how we're practically geographically going to break this down. And we are going to learn as we go, but this is where we're starting. So what does this mean for you? Like right now, what does this mean? Well, first, uh, keep hanging in there. Hold on to this deep hope that God has not forgotten us. We will meet together somehow at some point, but we are moving forward and we're moving forward in a way that we believe will help each other find our way back to God in a more tangible and effective and transformative way. Something else you can do is to be patient with us and give us some grace. There's going to be challenges and obstacles along the way. We are learning from churches all over the country who are doing something similar to this, but we are learning. Um, what this means for our leaders uh, is those of you who have served in our community in some capacity, uh, we need you to still be leaders. We would love to hear from you and include you about what community and formation and mission might look like within each of our parishes. We need help. We need your leadership and your ownership now more than ever. Uh, and what this means for our staff is that our staff's gonna become much less specialized in our roles on staff. So, so each of our staff members will continue to hold some of our original job descriptions but primarily we're gonna be pastors over each of these parishes in more of a general sense. So those within Parish X, which is East and South Knoxville, effective immediately, you can address me as Reverend Molly Most High. Um, no, we're gonna to continue to collaborate as a staff, uh, doing similar things across each parish. But for example, if we need help thinking through some family and kids stuff within a parish, Rachel will play a key role in helping navigate that. But when it comes to, to the general leadership over each of these parishes, we're all gonna take on similar roles over each of these groups. So that's what it means for you. That's what it means for our leaders. That's what it means for our staff. But I think the most exciting thing is what this all means for our neighborhoods and for our city. So I sit on Mayor King Cannon's Neighborhood Advisory Council and this group of neighborhood leaders sit around uh, and dream about neighbors connecting and serving each other and how to make the places we live flourish. Uh, but I get goosebumps to think about how much more powerful it is to be a group of neighbors who serve and connect, who make our neighborhoods better places because we have deep roots in the identity and the story of God. And we have deep roots as Jesus to model the best way to be human. Shifting to a more geographic focus of the church means our neighbors have an opportunity to know Jesus and participate in the kingdom of God in a way that is truly incarnational, that is truly about God coming to dwell among us. So that's you, that's our leaders, that's our staff, that's our city. Basically what this means for the church as a whole, like Big C Church, for, for those everywhere trying to follow Jesus, this means that we're continuing to innovate how to best be the church in the midst of whatever is happening culturally, socially, politically, and economically. This means our church will truly be scattered, not disconnected, 
scattered in all of our various places. It means this is going to be less and less about the pastor and more and more about all of us together working out what it means to follow the way of Jesus in our neighborhoods. Okay, so that gives you an idea um, of what we're trying to move towards. And again, we're going to spend the next three weeks teaching and talking about what all this means. But as we go, and, and Molly mentioned this, uh, realize we're all learning here and we're going to need some grace. We're building this thing as we go. Uh, to refer to another analogy we used back in, in March, um, this is no longer blizzard. We're not battening down the hatches and making sure we get enough food. I'm not even sure it's winter anymore. It feels like that we've moved into the Ice Age. And parish thinking is a move into the Ice Age, where things have to be different. This is paradigm shifting. This is us evolving and changing as we grow into a movement. But that's the type of community that we've dreamt about being. This isn't so much about what you get. This is about us trying to navigate this changing ecclesial church culture this new normal, this new age we're living into. And this is about us moving toward a deep hope. Not a cheap hope, where you just sit around and, geez, I hope things will get better. Not a dead hope, the despair that comes when the cheap hope dies, but a deep hope. <laughs> We've been talking about this since the first Sunday of 2020. We had no idea how applicable it was for us. We're talking about a deep hope, which is not knowing how everything's going to turn out, but it's doing our best to live the wisest way we possibly can. It's owning our small part of this much, much bigger story and allowing God to do whatever he so desires to make his dreams come true for us all. That's what we want. That's what we want to pursue. That's what we want to be about as a community together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for a chance to share as a family, to share as a community, where we think you want us to move. May we be hearing correctly. May we follow well. May we be wise. May we see our part in this much larger story and play it well. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, we would love to invite you into a time of, of uh, stopping centering here on Jesus. There's been a lot of thoughts thrown at you. I get it. But let's just pause for a moment together with a piece of bread of some sort, a cup of some sort. May we enter into the remembering of the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus. Again, we are a faith community that is centered on this Jesus. We want to look like him and think like him and act like him, be the aroma of Christ in this world. Let us pause. I would encourage you on this, you even just to pause your video and take some deep breaths, some moments to really take in the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and enter in again to this story of Jesus.
We know that tomorrow is the first day of school for a lot of our teachers and children. And so we want to take the time this morning to pray over everyone involved. We would love to pray over our children. So please just go ahead. If they're in another room or doing something, if you would just ask them to come and join you or go and get them. Um, and as your children are coming um, to you, I just want to go over just a few announcements. Um, we have a lot of set great session groups coming up. Um, a lot of them are going to be starting in September. So if you are interested in joining those, you can contact Molly or um, the leaders of those groups. Uh, we will have morning and evening prayer over Zoom on Tuesday and Thursday at 8 a.m. and at 8 p.m. And also, we will have our first parish greenhouse on Saturday, September 12th from 9 to 10 a.m. So go ahead and mark your calendars to attend that time of community and vision casting. Um, and if you would like to connect your financial resources with the mission of helping people find their way back to God, you can give online at our website or you can mail a check into the office. And as we pray over everyone involved in going back to school tomorrow, I just invite you to place your hands on your child or your children. Um, and I just invite you to even just reach out your hands in a posture of receiving or also extending blessing and shalom for all of those involved in this really complex and overwhelming undertaking. God, we know that children are near and dear to your heart. And we know that you not only invited them to come to you, but you embrace them. And we ask that you embrace the children that are in our midst. May they have an overwhelming sense of identity and belonging and meaning found in you and in this community. And for the parents and guardians who are feeling overwhelmed, please bring them your peace. Please reassure them that long before their child was theirs, their child was and is still yours. Please surround our families with the deep reassurance of your presence. And as a community, we desire to lead and nurture not just our child, but all of our children. So please lead us and show us how. Help us to know who and how to encourage. Give us the strength to look beyond our own needs and to learn how we can care for the needs of those around us. Help us to find comfort and care in one another and in you. And we ask that you help us to show grace to ourselves when we are all being asked to carry more than we could ever carry alone. And may this deep awareness of our own individual inadequacies foster a deep desire for community and dependence upon you. And when you tell us to come to you and to take your yoke upon us because your burden is light, help us to realize that it's your presence that brings rest, not a change in our circumstances. Help us all to be drawn to your presence. Help us to not run away from discomfort, but to trust and maintain a deep hope that you're making all of us and all the things around us new. Thank you for your gracious love that continues to help us believe that you are making all things beautiful and new in your time. So help us to trust and help us to believe. And in Jesus' name, amen. Shalom.